Hello and welcome. My name is Dale Richards, CEO of App Creative, an app development company on the Silicon Slopes of Utah. We're on a mission to build apps that change the world. If you want to build apps, grow your SaaS business, and make money doing cool software entrepreneur related stuff, start now by subscribing and hitting the bell. My amazing guest today is Tiff Palmatier, CEO and founder of Two Ferry. After a long night of partying, you may have a ride back home, but you don't want to leave your car behind. Two Ferry is a driving service that helps get you and your car home safely. Before we start, subscribe and click the bell to get more updates from the channel. And now let's get to that interview. We're going to talk about Two Ferry, and what I'm most curious to hear about is your overall journey. Now, it would be helpful if you could share with us what is Two Ferry, so that people know like the context around the app concept. Sure. But also. Um, like, why did you start it? And uh, where are you now? And what are some of the challenges you faced? So let's start with, what is Two Ferry? Tell us about the app concept and what inspired you to create it. Sure. So Two Ferry is an app-based marketplace. And what we solve for is uh, basically designated driving services to move your uh, the person and the vehicle. So for example, uh, let's say you go out and you have a second glass of wine with dinner and you've got your car with you. Today there's really no good solution for that. Uh, you either have to leave your car behind and pick it up the next day, which no one wants to do that, or you risk it and here in Utah, you know, a, a DUI is like .05 limit, which is typically about one glass of wine. So anyway, we just send a second driver, uh, you call us for a ride and we come and take you in your own vehicle home and that's about it. It's pretty straightforward. And how long ago did you start working on this concept? So the idea has been rattling around my brain for about a dozen years. Um, originally, it started out as you just take my phone number and I come scoot to you on this uh, gas-powered like scooter that went like maybe topped out at like 35 miles an hour, so it's pretty scary. And it would fold up into your trunk, and I would get in your car, drive you home, and then I'd take my little scooter app back out and go away. But at the time, I was living in Colorado. And just picture like that part of Dumb and Dumber where like the boogers were like flying. <laughs> like that's what I felt like because it just wasn't realistic living in a mountain town. Well, so you were doing this. Like you were actually I out on the, the scooter. scooter. Yeah, and I maybe did like one ride for like a friend and it was like, mm, no, I'm going to work. <laughs> Never plus, again. Yeah, and I didn't know anything about business back then. Like I was so young and dumb and, you know, big ideas, but not really any idea how to execute them. I was like 22 or something like that, 23. So. Well, I think that the... Um, I think that the concept, though, especially uh, of just the solo driver going to chauffeur you, is cool and could you know maybe maybe works really well in, a, in kind of more of a metropolitan setting, you know, exactly. where you can get, take the metro to some place, or mm -hmm. you can. You know, but I could see how that could be problematic, especially out here, where like you, you know you basically drive almost everywhere. Right, and it is a concept that's uh, in other countries, like especially like Asian countries, do it where you can call up for a driver and they come get you. So how did you go from single driver, you know, that person gets to you on that person's own power, to we need two people? So because of my market, I'm going to do best in non-metropolitan areas, right? Like any anywhere where there is no good transport, public transportation is where I'm kind of focusing on first. And so that's cities like Nashville, Denver, here, Portland, Phoenix, you know, places that are kind of these smaller cities but have the need for the service and so in order to do that scooting around you know like even just from here to my house was 20 miles I'm not going to scoot that far so having a car um, with the two drivers just kind of made more sense. So that became a point of differentiation for you like mm -hmm. hey we are focused on non-metropolitan non like yes. metro outfitted areas yes. okay all right interesting mm -hmm. can you describe the process you went through of like, kind of validating or invalidating pivoting around that that concept like how long did it take you uh how much did you fail how quickly did you fail what would you have done differently now in terms of testing and proving out your concept yeah great question so it really just started out out of my own need like i kept going and taking clients out to after directly after work and i drove to work i had my car with me they're like oh tiff like stay for scotch and, uh, and so I was leaving my car behind all the time mm -hmm. and I was like I really need a service that can just take me in my car home why does this not exist why does this not exist and I kind of kept waiting for it and I said you know what I'm just gonna do it and so that was the start of the idea now how I validated it well first of all I know there's a lot of other people in my shoes like just casually talking to my friends about the service or random people and what we did was we branded ourselves with 
two fairy logos, and we went to various festivals uh, in and around Salt Lake. So like mm-hmm. Utah Beer Fest a couple of years ago. And again, take 2020 just like out. So I started this like <laughs> right. two years ago, but really it's like the work has been going on for about a year. So anyway, in the summer of 2019, we did um, Snowbird Oktoberfest. We went to um, all the bars downtown, like just me and my crew of people and like handed up flyers and talked to people about the idea. And everybody liked it. Like there wasn't a single person that is in the bar restaurant industry or understands human nature and alcohol that wasn't like, oh my gosh, this is so needed. And when, when are you available? Cause I will tell all my clients about this. And so that was enough to just kind of start doing the testing. And then we were just offering rides, just no technology, just, you know, at Park City Wine Fest, like a bunch of driving teams just kind of sitting around, like talking to people, flyering cars. And um, and we got some business from that. Like we got paying customers. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to start working on an app. But to do it all over again, um, I probably would have um, just done more of that, like done more testing. Um, really uh, took better notes and just captured more information. It was... it. Looking back at it now that I've been through school and all these other uh, things that I've done lately, I'm like, man, I was really flying by the seat of my pants and I didn't really have any structure or documentation about the user testing. I didn't really do formal user interviews. So I would have, uh, if I could do it all over again, I would have done some of that stuff for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Um, tell us about some of the challenges that you faced. They could be technical challenges. They could be, you know, business or validation challenges. You talked about, you know, not having the structure. So, like, how did these problems come to the surface? Like, uh, what what pain did they create for you? So, really, the okay. So the biggest pain was that I went really big out of the gate, and that was my own silliness. How, how so? So once I felt, felt like I had something, I was onto something, and I had all this positive feedback and some paying customers without any technology whatsoever, I was like, let's just build the apps. Like, I'm going to build Uber with two drivers, essentially. And so that, I, I mean, and I documented, I, I had this beautiful business plan, I had this really great, like, requirements document, I thought, and I just kind of went through and, uh, you know, found some offshore development, because that's all that I could afford. And just got right to work. This is 2019. You this said? is 2019. Okay. Yeah. So again, what I've learned now, hindsight's 2020. I would have <laughs> <laughs> definitely just done something a little bit more MVP. I'm really like I went like right to like V1 of huh. app. You know. What What do you mean exactly? Like how How did you go right to V1? So I, I have. Like you like had like lots of features that you maybe didn't have to be in it or something. Yeah. Or? Like I have this whole functioning app that broadcasts to drivers that pairs driver teams together that does all these really fancy things to just scale out of the gate. And I blame my my background. I, I came up through corporate America, so I worked at AT&T for a million years. And uh, I was always doing like large scale projects and large scale software deployments. That was like part of my job. And so when I went to building this thing, I could have just had like a website low code thing, but I just, you know, jumped the shark or whatever they, mm-hmm. whatever they say. What is it about your first product that you feel like was um, was too much or not minimally viable? It's still not done. So like here we are two years later and there's still little bugs, still little quirks. Every time there's an update on iPhone, it seems to break. It's just, there's just so much to manage and do. Like I feel like I can't even get out of my own way because mm-hmm. this app is just so beefy and complicated. It's built on old technology because remember I had to do it on the cheap. Um, yeah, there's a lot of... A lot of things that I should have done differently. What were the what were the mm, how many how many vendors have you gone through so far? Two, so two. far. So you work with two different software development. Two different software vendors. development teams, and then actually it's a freelancer that's doing most of the work right now who knows my ancient uh, tech stack. So you have closed the engagement with the second software company. They're still kind of PMing it, but um, okay. but yeah, it's. They, they don't have that skill set on their own staff, so they had to go outsource it. So what's next? Like, how, what's left for you to do? You've got some QA issues, it sounds like. Yep. You know, you have to solve some bugs. It's breaking. Um, actually, first, before I ask that, what stack is it built on? Are you, is this like Swift, like native kind of stuff for yeah. app, Apple iOS? Yep, that's exactly what it do is. Do you have an Android version and as well? And there's an Android version, too. So technically, I have two code four bases. apps. Yeah, because there's a driver app and user app for iOS and a driver app and user app for Android. 
Wow, okay. And then you've got a back-end service somewhere mm -hmm. on Amazon Web Services? Or? It is on AWS, but, um, yeah, the code, I, I, it's Laravel or something Okay, like yeah. Yeah. All right. PHP. So if you're on Laravel, that's cool. So, okay. so... <clears throat> So then, so now what is it? This this is it a co-founder? Is it a friend? Like, is, who is this person relative to you? This person that's, that's now doing most of the, the dev work. So it's it's actually just an outsourced uh, outsourced fractional CTO. Okay. And they're a company based out of Toronto, okay. and their specialty is helping startups figure out their technology. Hired them again. They didn't have the expertise in hand, so they they bring in this um, this uh, freelancer, and it's been fine. So did you? So are you retaining ownership then, or is this person going to get a por portion of your company now? Or? Nope, I just pay them, a okay. uh, contractor. And I did bring on a co-founder, um, my friend Nathan Sutherland. I don't know if you have met him. He's a 1MC. I met him through 1MC. What's his last name? Uh, Sutherland. Nathan oh, yeah. Sutherland. Okay. He, has a, he was working on his own thing called Sponsored, but I pestered him enough to come over and help me out. So he's trying to figure out like what basically redoing everything and starting over is going to look like right now but we're just trying to get these apps out right now to use them as our MVP and like get them on the app stores and start getting traction here in Salt Lake. So your goal is still to release these four yes. apps that you have. That's the goal. Okay, and then after that, you're gonna revisit like, okay, well, maybe how should we yep. how should we revamp this? Yeah, get used to feedback. How close are you to having those four apps out? So I, I always feel like I'm really close mm -hmm. and then it's always something else. Like what? Like, like, uh, for example, like we just did, the app is functioning really great. We do some real testing with like real rides and the driver payments were showing in the app as a negative. So they couldn't pay themselves. Like they couldn't transfer the earnings that they had within the app to their actual bank account. It's like okay. little crap like that, but it's like constant, constantly something that comes up that no one had noticed before. Yeah, maybe it's time to get just like a, a trained QA person to go through and just beat the crap out of your app and like log all the yeah. bugs they possibly can and say, like, hey, here's all the stuff you need to fix. Yes, that would be ideal. Yeah, yeah. Do you have like a goal date in terms of in market by this date or, you know, beta test? You already have some users that are using it, testing it. Obviously, I do. I have, yeah. I've got some friends, uh, but it's all through test flight, as you know. Um, okay. And so if people aren't, a general human being is like, confused by the fact they have to download test play and then click this link and <laughs> yeah. all these things so it really is like my friends and like clo and like technical people who are like i'll use this <laughs> people that you can trust to get into test flight successfully right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it is a, a small subset of my people you know that's hard because you think like oh yeah well we can put people on this via test flight and then you just talk about like no, except for that person. Like, right. <laughs> that's awful it sounds awful yeah that is true um you um so uh You've experienced all these amazing things over the last two years. Yeah. You have jumped in, you know, head first. You have gotten beat up a little bit. You kind of had a taste of, of SaaS life. Yeah. What would you say to someone who was doing their first SaaS product, their first app? You know, like they don't have the experience that you've had for the last two years. Yeah. What would you share with them? Well, honestly, I First and foremost, I would say you can do it. I think a lot of people are really terrified of it, and tech is the future, obviously. So as painful as the process was, like I'm still trying to look at it as like I've got something, I was able to do it. It, it, cre it requires a lot of grit and mental fortitude, but if you have that and you're really passionate about something, like you can do it, even if you have no background. And I had like a pseudo, very pseudo technical background where mm. I would like lead projects, but I, I don't code myself. Right. People kept saying I was so insane for even taking on such a big thing without any code experience, but I was like, I can, we can figure it out. Um, what I wish I would have had, though, is um, someone who I really trusted who really was deep in tech local. So I was doing it all by myself with the, with a language barrier, with a time barrier. Mm -hmm. You know, that was just hard and finding out and finding people you can trust that are not from here, like not even from the United States. Um, it's just a really kind of scary thing and, and I did you know I, I would have done things probably differently um, so yeah so just make sure that you do have someone who can explain to you the technical side if you're not technical yourself is uh, would have just made things easier not mm -hmm. say so you can't not do it but it would have made things a little bit smoother I think great thank you thank yeah. you very much yeah such a pleasure to hear about two ferry yeah everybody who is uh, who, who needs a ride home to get them in their car home? They should, they yeah. should check you guys out. Yeah, and and you asked when we when we we're supposed to launch, and and I didn't really give you a good answer. Oh. 
we're, um, there's a Women Who Succeed. It's a new foundation here in town, and it's just a powerhouse. It's becoming this like powerhouse organization almost instantly. It's been amazing. And they're doing a big gala. It's led by the GAR uh, Foundation, too. And uh, that's on September 30th. So we're actually going to be there giving rides during that gala. And so we have to be at least pretty pretty functional by then. So September. I mean, I want to get out sooner than that. Yeah. But we must get out by then because I'm actually like on the like title sponsor of the event. So if I can't give rides. Well, good. You've got a deadline. I've got a drop dead deadline finally. And I'm pretty stoked about it. No, that's great. That's great. Um, I think you have to do that sometimes. Like, yeah. hey, you know, we here's the reason why we need to market by this date. Therefore, there's some urgency. And I think that if you don't have urgency in building apps, that you're just going to drag it out because there you'll never really be done. Apps are never done. Right. You know, right. you all, you're always have a new version, new enhancements, you know, more quality uh, that you're trying to achieve. So, so I just want to say. Uh, kudos to you for taking this on and for not giving up. I admire your grit. Thank you. I agree. It does take grit. And uh, everyone who's watching, uh, go get some grit. Yeah. All right. Do it. Thanks, Dale. Thank you. <laughs>